Welcome back to the Gospel Ogen channel. I've been gone for a while and I'm happy to be back with you and we're going to talk about some prayers in the Bible. I'm hoping to do more of that with you over the next few weeks. But first of all, I want to look at what can we learn from the first prayer in the Bible. And the first prayer in the Bible is kind of a surprising one. I actually went online and I found a book in my Logos Bible Study software. Uh, with, if you're not familiar with that, check out the links in the description. You can get some of that on discount from me. But in Logos Bible Study software, there's a book on prayers of the Bible and the guy listed all of them out. And I was very surprised that the very first prayer in your Bible is Noah's prayer after he got drunk and wakes up. It's crazy. It's in Genesis chapter 9. And so you know the story. <coughs> the ark has landed. The family has descended. They've grown some grapes. They get some wine. And Noah gets drunk and one of the sons sees him there. And then all of a sudden he, we're not sure what exactly happened, but it wasn't good and it was kind of shameful. And scholars debate over whether he just looked at Noah or whether more happened. But then the other brothers come in and they turn their backs and they cover their father's nakedness and they're praised for that. But Noah, as soon as he sobers up and he figures out what happens, he has this prayer in Genesis chapter 9. Let me read it to you. It starts here in verse 26. It says, he also said, Worthy of praise is the Lord, the God of Shem. May Canaan be the slave of Shem. May God enlarge Japheth's territory in numbers. May he live in the tents of Shem. And may Canaan be the slave of Japheth. So when Moses says that, we can learn a couple of things. And I think the first takeaway for anybody just like, what do I learn from the first prayer in the Bible? Well, the very first prayer in the Bible is on the heels of one of the greatest victories in the Bible. So Noah and his family have escaped a worldwide catastrophic flood. Uh, and by the way, if you're not convinced of the worldwide flood, I've had a debate with some atheists who like to disagree with that. I'm actually reading a book right now. That's called The Genesis Flood by Henry Morris. I will leave a link to that in the description so you can pick up a copy. Super cheap and phenomenal looking at the evidences of the flood. But the worldwide flood has happened, and it's all done. And Noah and his family, they've survived. They're like the only family alive on earth right now, and God's going to do things through them. And Noah gets drunk. Like, it's a bad day. And I've heard some people argue that, well, no, the, the grapes had never fermented that much before. Noah, he, it wasn't really a sin for him. Well, that doesn't make any sense, because if you actually have ever partaken in alcohol, you find really quickly that you know when it's affecting your body. And Noah apparently went not just a little tipsy, he went to full-on slob drunk, and that's where he was at, and he wakes up. So I think the first takeaway for us is that even in our greatest victories, we all need mercy all the time. And when we forget our need for mercy, that is when the failures happen. I, the devil was waiting for Noah. Uh, the world, the flesh, and the devil are enemies is what the Bible tells us. I don't know if this is his flesh or the devil just playing off his flesh or how it's going to work out uh, when God looks at it. That's his business. But no one needs mercy all the time, and you and me need mercy all the time. And if we ever forget our need for God's mercy, then we're prone to attack and temptation. And so I love that the first thing we can see is that even if things are going great and wonderful and awesome and God is working, we still need God's mercy all the time. The next thing we see is that he said, he starts off his prayer like this. It says, worthy of praise is the Lord, the God of Shem. It is right and worthy to praise God all the time. Even in the midst of our failures, even in the midst of our shame, even in the midst of our pain and embarrassment and humiliation, because this is humiliating. Even in the midst of humiliation and shame, it is right and good to be praising God. And I think sometimes in our human natures, humiliation and embarrassment cause us to withdraw and we get dark corners and we get by ourselves and we don't want anyone else to see Noah runs to the Lord and he runs to the Lord praising the Lord God is worthy of our praise whether or not you're having a good day or a bad day and God is always happy to receive your praise you can run to God whether you're doing good or whether you're not doing good you can still run to God and praise him that is an appropriate and right response and the last thing and I really struggled with this because he curses uh, Canaan Canaan has to be the slave of Shem. And I don't like that personally because Canaan wasn't the one that did the sin. Ham was the one that went in and saw his father naked if you actually read Genesis 9. And so I sat there and I wondered, why is God cursing Canaan and not Ham? And personally, I don't feel like that's fair. But then, of course, we're reminded that God is in the heaven. He does as he pleases. The creator has the right to do whatever he wants. God's ways are higher than my thoughts. He's always just. He's always good. He's always right. So if God chose to do it, it's right whether I understand it or not. And I think that's a good tip for just approaching theology in general. God is right, whether I understand it or not. And if I don't understand it and I can't defend it, that's okay because God is right. And so first of all, yes, God is right. He has the right to do whatever he wants. And it's good because God is a good God. He had a good reason for doing this, whether I know it now or not. But the second of all, He's securing and narrowing down the line of Christ here because he blesses Shem. Shem gets the biggest blessing here. 
in verses 26 through 27. And that is going to be the line from which Christ is going to come. So in the midst of Noah's failure, uh, God is still promising Christ to his people. And I think that's encouragement for all of us. Just because you're having a bad day or you fail doesn't mean that God can't do great and wonderful things. So I think we can learn three things from this prayer of Noah. We can learn that we need mercy all the time. We can learn that we need to praise God, even in our failures. And we can learn that God is always working his plan with Christ the whole time, whether we understand it or not. If you like this content, please subscribe to my channel so you get notifications and you can see what else I have.